All right, let's get this party started. I'm going to kind of blitz through this first part here, but go ahead and create a directory, and the directory is going to be the name of your project. Uh, keep in mind that will also be the name of your Git repo. First thing I'm going to do is install Go. Um, I just use Homebrew to do that, and uh, it's already installed on my computer, so kind of just uh, doing that for demonstration purposes. The next step is to install the Cobra command line tool which comes along with the Cobra package for Go and it helps you to auto-generate some code that you need to uh, build out your CLI. After you get Cobra installed, the next thing to do is just initialize your Git repo. And then finally, we're going to initialize this repo as a Go module. And now we can use the Cobra tool that we previously installed to go ahead and initialize this project. You can see it generates a couple files here and a couple folders that are necessary to operate your program. One of them is the main.go file and the other one is a command directory which contains a package and has kind of the, the meat of what is going on here. The main.go file in a Cobra CLI is pretty straightforward. It really only has one function, that's main, and all it does is it calls the execute function, which is inside of the command package, uh, obviously in the folder uh, just above. Inside of the command package, there's one file, it's called root.go, and there's a lot of generated code in here for you that kind of gives an example of how to run this, and mostly all we're going to do is just modify this a little bit. Going to change the description up, not a big deal. I'm also going to change up the long description to give a little more detail as to uh, what the program is going to do. Now it's time to get this thing working for the first time, so just uncomment the uh, run line there and add something in. I'm just going to do a basic print line and we're going to say hello world. And then we're going to go down to the command line at the bottom and we're going to use the basic go run uh, command to run this program and see if it spits out what we're looking for. And look at that, we got some output. Um, it's not really a command line tool yet because we're running the Go application you know, from, from the compiler, but uh, it's doing what, we're, what it's supposed to do. The next thing to do is to mess around a little bit with the flags that you can do in Cobra. So right now you can see in the example, there's one here called toggle. And all that toggle is is a basic Boolean value uh, with, the, with the letter T for the shortcut flag and the full word toggle for the long flag. So if you were to call this uh, right now and do go run main.go-t, it would uh, flip that to true. Or go run main.go-toggle, it would flip it to true. I'm just going to mess with this a little bit, change the name of it. Um, to make it a little more descriptive and then we'll give it a shot. All right, now that I've changed the description of the toggle, I'm gonna go back up to the run function here and uh, wrap this code with some logic that is going to depend on the value of that toggle. Struggled a little bit with this here as I went through and figured out how to access the value of that toggle. There's a couple different ways you can do this uh, in, a, in a Cobra application. One is to assign the value of a toggle to a variable, which is what I usually do, but I didn't do here for whatever reason. So uh, I took a little bit of time to figure out how to access it directly instead of just accessing the variable that I usually assign. Either way, what this is going to do is print hello world if the flag is false or not set and hello world alternative if uh, the flag is uh, is set. Now we'll just go ahead and build this one more time to make sure that it's working and uh, we'll see that we get both the outputs depending on whether or not the flag is set and then we'll clean up the description a little bit, do a little bit of housekeeping, and then compile it one more time, this time to an actual executable file. Now that it's a fully built application, you can actually just run the command directly like a real command line tool and see that it works, and it does. 
So now it's time to move on to the next part. Just really quickly here, I'm going to vendor all of the dependencies for this application just so they're all packaged together in the uh, source code. Now let's move on to the Go Releaser setup. Um, Go Releaser is a great tool. I'm going to walk through all of the individual pieces and parts that I put into the Go Releaser config file and I'll show you the configuration on their website so you can see where you can look up the documentation yourself. In the build section, we're going to add the name of the binary. Uh, in this case, Ask Cloud Hello World. It's the same as the name of the project. We're going to specify the operating systems. I am specifying Darwin and Linux, where Darwin is Mac OS and Linux is obviously Linux. I'm going to specify the architectures, so AMD64 and ARM64. Uh, that way it works on both the new M1 Macs as well as the Intel Macs. I'm going to provide the environment variable to disable uh, CGO. And finally, we're going to add the flag to tell the application to use the vendor dependencies instead of pulling them from the internet. Here on the Go Releaser website, this is the builds section, which shows you all of the options that are available for the build section of the YAML file. Obviously, there's a ton of stuff here. Uh, I leave the defaults except for the things that I'm going to change. Next is the release section. I'm just going to change one thing here, and we're going to set uh, pre-releases to auto. This is going to make it so if you tag your work with a pre-release version number, meaning something with a dash or a plus, it won't actually build it and, and distribute it. The next step is to add the universal binaries setting. Uh, this is relatively new uh, since M1 Max started showing up on the scene. And all this is saying is that for Mac OS, create a universal binary instead of two individual ones where you would have to pick which one you want. Again, here's all the details and uh, I'm only changing this one value. Next is the brews section, which controls all of the settings for uploading this application to a homebrew tap. I'm providing the name here, which is the same as the name of the binary and then providing a home page. Uh, if your application has its own home page, you can provide anything you want here, but I'm just providing a link to the GitHub repo for this application. Next is to provide the information of the homebrew tap. Uh, in my case, I've created a single tap for all of my applications that are that lives at Cloud Architect. And the name of the tap is homebrew Cloud architect where homebrew will automatically remove the homebrew dash so you can just specify the uh, the last name so here in the in my github project here you can see the homebrew tap that i've already created from another uh, program that i've created the next section has to do with the commit author. I'm just going to provide my own details here to indicate that when this is committed to the homebrew tap, it'll come through as a commit from me. And here are all the settings for homebrew taps and everything that you can do uh, to configure them. There are, as the rest of this areas, there's a ton of settings that you can change, um, and I have only overridden the defaults where necessary. The final section is just simply the checksum setting, which is going to specify the file name that will get pushed up to the releases tab on this project with the checksums for each of the binaries. So that way, if you download them, you can check to make sure that you receive them in their full integrity. And here's all the settings. Again, just leaving everything at the defaults except for the one entry which specified the file name. The next part of this is going to be creating the instructions for GitHub Actions. To accomplish this, you're going to create a, f a folder called .github. That's where all of the actions live for, for GitHub Actions. And then we're going to add another folder inside of there called Workflows. 
and next create a file called release.yaml. This will contain all the instructions for what to do for a release. Go Releaser has a GitHub Actions workflow that you can simply copy and paste from their website. So I'm going to copy this from their website and paste it in and we'll make a couple modifications to do the action a little bit differently than what they have specified here. The first part here is the on section which tells GitHub when to actually run this action. I'm going to change this so it only triggers when you push a tag. The rest of this is going to stay pretty much the same until we get to the bottom which has to do with the actual running of Go Releaser. There's a couple changes we're going to make here. The first one is I'm going to change the secret name from GitHub token. to publisher token and I'll get to that in a second we're gonna create a secret in github called publisher token that gives this project permission to publish to the homebrew tap the second change I'm going to make here is to override the version number with the tag that you have created and pushed since this triggers when a tag gets pushed you can use that tag to specify the version of the application and everything kind of falls together really nicely now back in github uh, we're going to create a repo for the application that we just created so create a repo of the same name uh, that you created for the folder and the module and everything else uh, I'm going to make this public, so obviously if you want to take a look at it, you can go check it out on my GitHub page. I'm just going to grab the address here, and then go back to VS Code. Add the remote, give it a name, and now we can go ahead and make our initial commit and push all of this code up to GitHub. Note that it won't trigger the GitHub action because the GitHub action only triggers when you push a tag. Now that we have the repo and it has all the source code, the next thing we're going to do is finalize the steps here in GitHub that are needed in order to make all of this actually fire. I'm going to go to the personal access token, token section of GitHub and I'm going to generate a new token. Just give it a descriptive name that you will remember. And then go ahead and check the box for repo, which will give it permission to do things to your repositories on your behalf, and go ahead and save the changes. Go ahead and copy the token, and before anybody gets any bright ideas, yes, of course, I deleted this token after filming the video. Now what you want to do is go back to the repo for the CLI that you created. Go to Settings, go to Secrets, and choose Action Secrets. In the name box, you're going to type Publisher Token, which is what we specified earlier in the Go Releaser file. Then you're going to paste the value of the token in and save those changes. All right, let's go ahead and try this thing out. Um, because I never remember the git command to create a tag and push a tag, I just go and look through my back scroll and find it. So I'm going to tag this CLI as version 0.1 and add a message and then I'm going to push that tag up to the remote. After you push the tag, you should be able to go back to GitHub, refresh the page, and see that you now have a yellow dot indicating that your action is running. If you click on the dot and then click on details, it'll bring up the action and you can watch the magic happen. While we're waiting for this to complete, if you made it this far, please take a moment to like the video and consider subscribing to my channel. It really helps. All right, it finished. Let's see if it worked. If you click on tags on the repo and then go to releases, you should see your version of your release and all of the binaries and the checksums that were all configured. And now if we go back to our terminal, we should be able to install this with Homebrew. So first off, I'm going to tell Homebrew to tap my Homebrew tap. And then we're going to go ahead and install the application. 
course, I made a typo there, so uh, go ahead and copy what it recommends I run, which is the right thing. All right, it's been installed. Now, I'm going to go over real quick and just delete the binary that I built manually over in the left before I run this, just to make sure that there's nothing weird going on with it, trying to run the wrong uh, version of the application. Now that that's gone, you should be able to run it. And look at that. It does what it's supposed to do. And if I run... The which command against the binary, it should show you that it's been installed by Homebrew by showing you that it's in the Homebrew bin. And finally, if we go back to the Homebrew tab, you should now see a new entry there for your CLI with all of the instructions for Homebrew that tells it how to install the application.